So, if you look at your listening guide tonight, it says at the very top, Reverend Greg Mott. Okay, that's not me. I'm David Self, all right? Pastor Greg texted me yesterday afternoon and said, I have a 102 degree temperature. I've been in bed all day long. Can't preach tomorrow. Need you to preach. I said, I'm on it. I mean, every preacher has one kind of, you know, in, in the well, ready to preach, instant in season, out of season. He said, now, you can preach on anything you want, but you need to know we've printed up 5,000 of these listening guides that already have my application points on them and the scripture listed. So, you know, do whatever you want to, but if you want to be a good steward of what we've already done, you'll preach my message. So this is kind of a combo deal. This is Pastor Greg's outline, but all of it is my illustration. So if you like one, you know, or don't like the other, you'll know where the attribution is to go. We're going to look at 1 John, the third chapter, verses 19 through 24, continues in our series on 1 John, All You Need Is Love. And um, we read in, in verse 19, this is how we know we belong to the truth and will convince our conscience in his presence. This is how we know. Now that's a theme of 1 John. This is how we know. And it's to combat, that. this is the first uh, blank you've got there, that we should walk in confidence, that is this we should know, not condemnation. Now, Pastor Greg talked about this quite a bit last week. He, he said, don't be harder on yourself than God is. For God so loved the world. God commended his love toward us. And throughout the book of 1 John, we read of God's love. But oftentimes, God, I mean, Satan comes against us with discouragement. If you were at Midnight Madness, oh, by the way, if you were at Midnight Madness and you were around Pastor Greg... He taught a small group, and if you become symptomatic, running a temperature, don't have any, let me save you a trip to the doctor's office. This is what he told me. Take two aspirin, drink plenty of fluids, and stay in bed. That's the, that's the cure. But at Midnight Madness, they quoted me in the, the little textbook, and it said, Satan's greatest weapon against life Bible study is discouragement. Now, I took that from Dr. James Kennedy, who used that same quotation, Satan's greatest weapon against evangelism is discouragement. Let me just say this, Satan's greatest weapon against you in the Christian life is discouragement. In every area, whether it's generosity or evangelism or service, he makes you want to think that what you do doesn't matter, that he, no one notices, it's not effective, it's discouragement. And the anecdote to that is confidence. Uh, I read somewhere that the third Monday in January is known as Blue Monday. It's supposed to be the worst day of the year for discouragement. Now that's a combination of the weather and people's sickness and uh, credit card bills coming due from Christmas. And by that point, everyone's broken their New Year's resolutions and so that has been identified, Blue Monday, third Monday in January, is the worst day of the year for discouragement. We're kind of in that season right now. It reminded me of a, a story about the Golden Gate Bridge. It's known for a lot of things, but it's known, unfortunately, for people taking their lives by jumping off the bridge. And there was one such jumper one day that stalled traffic in both directions, and he stood on the edge, he was going to jump, and a guy got out in a nicely tailored suit out of his uh, high-end luxury car, and he ran over to him, and he says, You are in luck, sir. I am a trained psychiatrist. If you'll pour out your story to me, I can make things all better. So after 30 minutes of hearing this guy's story, they both jumped. <laughs> discouragement is a real thing, and discouragement about your Christian life is a real thing. When we start depending on conscience rather than the Spirit's witness within us, we can get real discouraged. I'm dealing with a couple of people right now, very, people very close to me, that just can't get victory over knowing they're going to heaven. And I mean, that's an important thing. Knowing that you're going to heaven when you die, knowing you have a relationship with God, I would say there's not a bigger issue that we have. The uh, evangelism explosion that Dr. James Kennedy he had a diagnostic question suppose you were to die today and stood before God and he were to say to you why should I let you into heaven what would you say 
What would you say? Most people are kind of works-oriented. I try to be good. I try to do the best I can. But, but really, John says in the book of 1 John, there's really five evidences that you really have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And these are, are lined out in the book. They're all alluded to in chapter 3. Number one is you have a change in moral character. Chapter 1, verse 6, you've gone from darkness to light. Uh, you see things different. You evaluate things different. You try, to, you try to act as a kingdom citizen wanting to accomplish God's plan here on this earth. Secondly, you have a love for other Christians. Uh, chapter 3, verse 14. And there are several other uh, references to this throughout 1 John. In fact, the, the disciples, this is kind of an apocryphal story, I guess, but the disciples said, John, all you ever ever preach is little children love one another when are you going to preach a different sermon and the apostle John reportedly said when you begin acting on my first sermon I'll preach a second sermon but you'll find that throughout the book of first John that we have love for other Christians and I mean it's a valid question to ask it's identifiable it's observable do you like hanging out with Christians more than you like hanging out with non-Christians thirdly you are obedient to God's commands, chapter 2, verse 3. Um, you are obedient to his commands. Number four, you are willing to confess that Jesus is God in the flesh. Uh, chapter 4, verse 2 says that very plainly of 1 John. Uh, this was a time of great heresy. Gnosticism was a big thing in John's time. Uh, Serenthus was a famous teacher of Gnostic thought. And he said that Jesus really wasn't human. He just appeared to be human. And so we see John saying things like, look, I talked to him. I ate with him. I shook hands with him. I'm telling you, he was here, God in the flesh. The fifth thing is in tonight's passage, and that is the presence of the Holy Spirit. We see that in chapter 3, verse 24. So walk in confidence knowing that God has done this for you as a free gift he's given you eternal life and you are chosen you you are predestined you are you have a home in heaven uh, a new outlook like that changes the confidence of your walk uh, we just celebrated uh, Martin Luther King's 90th birthday on January the 15th Martin Luther King Day. D did you know it could have well been called Michael King Day? Because that's the name that appeared on his birth certificate. In fact, his dad was named Michael. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was Michael Jr. Until the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta sent his dad, Michael King, on an extended sabbatical to the Baptist World Alliance in Berlin, Germany. Now, as a part of that, he went to Greece, he went to Rome, might have even gone to Israel. He visited the Castle Church in Wittenberg, Germany, where Luther famously nailed those uh, 95 theses to the door. Now, think about the scene that was in Berlin, Germany in 1934. Hitler had just been appointed the premier of Germany, the leader, the Fuhrer of Germany. And so he was preaching a doctrine of racial intolerance, racial superiority. He was going to basically uh, leverage his whole Nazi movement on the basis of the racial superiority of, those, uh, of the Third Reich. So out of that atmosphere of hate, the Baptist World Alliance met in Berlin, 1934, and passed a resolution that racial intolerance is a not a part of the Christian manifesto, that Christians are not to be uh, racially prejudiced. That was a major statement in the capital of Germany, Nazi Germany, in 1934. It so inspired Michael King that he actually adopted Martin Luther's name. And when he came back to the Ebenezer Baptist Church, from that point on, he was known as Martin Luther King Sr., now, it wasn't until uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was age 28 that they literally crossed out the Michael on the birth certificate and wrote in Martin Luther King Jr. A change in outlook, a transformation on the inside resulted in a change of name. May I suggest to you 
that your transformation through Jesus Christ has resulted in a new name, Christian. Just to wear that name doesn't mean the transformation occurred, but it is an evidence, it is an outward expression, I'm no longer the same. I am a new person. I can walk in confidence. The second thing is to be blessable. The second blank that's on your listening guide is to be blessable. Listen to what he says about prayer and obedience. He said, dear friends, if our conscience doesn't condemn us, we have confidence before God and can receive whatever we ask from him because we keep his commands and do what's pleasing in his sight. Two, two conditions there. There are others uh, in other parts of the scripture, but two conditions that we keep his commands and do what's pleasing in his sight. So the two outward manifestations of our love for the Father are prayer and obedience. It's relationship, not rules. And we all break rules, right? Uh, I, I uh, heard about a guy the other day that was stopped for a traffic offense. Now, I'm sure that's never happened to any of you, but he was, go he was exceeding the speed limit, and a trooper pulled him over, and the first thing he said was, may I see your driver's license? This guy said, look, you police need to get your act together. The guy yesterday made me give him my driver's license, and now you want to see it. Don't you ever communicate with each other? Well, people break rules. I, I, I get that. But as Pastor Greg said a couple of weeks ago, it's not that Christians are sinless, it's that our transformed nature sins less. We are obedient and we are people of prayer. We're not people of prayer in order to get what we want. Uh, when I was a junior in high school, the Ford Motor Company came out with a new hot rod called the Shelby Cobra GT500. Now, if I had bought that for list price at the time, I could be a very wealthy person today because they're a collector's item. But at the time, all I could see with my 16-year-old brain was this hot, uh, like a 500 horsepower. It was a huge, big deal. And uh, so I read a verse like this, you know, if our conscience doesn't condemn us, we have confidence before God, we can receive whatever we ask from him. Okay, so I stopped right there. I got down on my knees. I waited till everybody was out of the house and I got down on my knees and began to pray earnestly. And I said, dear Lord, you said, ask and it shall be given. You said, we can ask whatever we want. I want a Shelby Cobra GT 500 and I'm asking that in faith. Uh, in fact, I began to rationalize why I wanted that car. I, I, could, I could visit prospects for the church, and wouldn't they be impressed with me if I drove up in that shiny new car? I can visit hospitals and tend to the ill, and I had it all worked out, and I told God. And so I, I said amen and got up, and I thought, well, I've got to be a person of faith. So I walked over to the front door and looked out into the driveway, and guess what? There was no car. And I fell under conviction. I was just a 16-year-old preacher boy, but I sat back down and I was somewhat disappointed that I didn't have my new car. But I, I, I'm not saying God spoke to me audibly, but within my spirit, he seemed to say, David, what are you driving? I said, a 63 um, VW Volkswagen, an air condition. And he said, well, does that get you where you want to go? Yeah. If you wanted to visit someone in the hospital, would it get you? Yeah. If you wanted to visit a prospect, will it get you from point A to point B? Yeah. Uh, does it cost less insurance-wise, gasoline, upkeep, than that car you wanted? Yeah, it does. So he said, I promised that I would supply your needs, and you need to trust me to direct your wants. You, you see, it says he'll grant whatever we want if we want to glorify him we keep his commands and we do what's pleasing in his sight John 14 15 Jesus said if you love me keep my commands we don't do that in order to earn his favor we do that because we have his favor now I'll say I, I grew up I grew up in a great Christian home my dad's preacher his dad was a preacher my mom's dad was a preacher it's like a family business but I, I was called individually. I just didn't fall into it. But I will say that I tremendously respected my dad. And I, I grew up in the late 60s. 
And someone probably correctly said, I mean, it was a time of rampant drug use and alcohol use. And someone said, if you really remember the 60s, you may not have been there. You know, uh, I mean, most people that were there don't remember what was going on. And I, I didn't get caught up in that, you know. And as I look back on it, it wasn't that I was afraid of getting caught. It wasn't that I was afraid of breaking the rules. I literally was afraid of disappointing my dad and mom. They had such confidence in me and gave me such, you know, freedom. They, they just took care of me. And I just couldn't imagine calling my dad from jail and wanting to be bailed out. I could not imagine. Let, I mean, I just knew how crushed he would be if I left the straight and narrow way. And I think that's the relationship we have with God. We don't obey his commands because we're afraid of getting caught and getting zapped and being punished. We do it because we have this great love for God. And we don't want to disappoint him. And we understand that his way is really best for us. And he has a plan for us to prosper us and give us an abundant life. So you're not earning eternal life. You're journeying with God. Uh, love is the evidence of that journey. Back during the recession of the 80s, uh, one of our deacons was into real estate development and, and had, had been very, very successful, but there was a downturn. And I mean, he just almost lost everything. He was leveraged out on several deals and had to bring his wife and family together in November and said, look, we're not going to have Christmas. I mean, we'll celebrate the day, and, but we're not going to have any presents. We just don't have any margin within our family budget to buy each other gifts. And I just want that to be understood from the outset. It's just really lean, lean times. And they all understood that, and they had had good times, and they understood this was going to be a lean time. But his business partner, who was doing much better on some other deals, understood that, that they weren't going to have Christmas and on Christmas Eve, he drove up to their house. He knocked on the door. Uh, the deacon's wife came to the door. And she said, what's the occasion? And he gave her the keys to a brand new SUV and said, Merry Christmas. She looked out at this beautiful car, obviously overcome with emotion, and received it. It became a family legend, obviously. But let me tell you what would have been an inappropriate response. If she had said, oh, that's a neat car. Here, I've got some loose change in my purse. Let me help you pay for that. Or, or if she had said, you know, I don't think you can afford that car. Let me work out some terms where I work for you for the next 10 years and pay that car off. You see, if she had responded that, it would have been insulting to the giver that he didn't know what he was doing. And if it's earned or it's deserved, it's not really a gift at all. But the Bible over and over again says the gift of God is eternal life. Romans 6, 23, the gift of God is eternal life. Uh, God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9, verse... Um, I believe it's 13. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And the gift of God is either a gift, totally undeserved by us, or it's something that we earn and deserve. And most people think that it's something we're earned or, or deserved. But in fact, it's a gift of God. Be blessable. Be a person who expresses their love through prayer and obedience. The, the last thing, and there are three action points that Pastor Greg listed in your notes. Let me cover those real quickly. Number one, believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. It's not a tip of the hat, as Pastor Greg said last night. It, it's not a matter of occasionally going to church, but mainly living for yourself. It's a matter of being sold out to him. And the theme of your life is Jesus there's an interesting dialogue that occurs in John, the sixth chapter. I think it's about verse 24, where the religious leaders come to him and say, what are the works that we must do to have this eternal life, to, to inherit this kingdom? What are the works we must do? And Jesus responds, this is the work that you must do. 
believe in the name of Jesus Christ and he who sent me. There's only one work that's going to be pleasing to God. That is believing in Jesus. Interestingly enough, that's the story of the feeding of the multitudes. And when he said to them, it's not any longer going to be bread and fish. It's going to be spiritual meat. Chapter 6, verse 66. It's pretty easy to remember. 666 of John says, And from that point, many left and followed him no longer. It requires us to believe in Jesus. Secondly, it requires us to, to love others. Jesus said in chapter 13 of the Gospel of John, verse 35, by this, all men, by, this, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples in that you carry a genuine cowhide leather bound study Bible. That's not what it says. It doesn't say they'll know you're my disciples by your church attendance, even your generosity. It says they'll know that you're my disciples in that you love one another. Love others. Love others. Uh, Pastor Greg last week talked about loving them organically. In other words, as the opportunity presents itself, show love to individuals, but also organizationally through support of things like the food pantry and the closed closet and all the faith center ministries that we do generally there are two types of people there are givers and there are takers there are those whose philosophy of of life is to get all you can can all you get and to sit on the can that that basically they are selfish in their outlook and they want to know what others can do for them Heard about a guy that visited his friend in the apartment and he fired up his iPad and he goes, hey man, your Wi-Fi's out. And the guy says, yeah, I think my neighbors didn't pay their bill. I mean, some people are always trying to gravy train on somebody else, right? And they're trying to get from others. He said, you need to demonstrate your Christianity by loving others. And finally, the third and last two blanks, abide, abide, Christ in you and you in Christ. Remember his video that he showed from the Pleasure Pier in Galveston, uh, strapping into that ride and being swung out over the Gulf of Mexico is pretty terrifying. But he said, I understood that as long as I abided in that car, kept the safety belt on, kept the shoulder harness on, I was safe. I was committing myself to that, to that uh, little car but he said, I could have made the decision that I no longer want to abide in that car and I could have been flung out into the Gulf of Mexico. A good picture of abiding. But what does it mean in, in, in practical terms in that we abide in Christ? It means that we see the world the way he sees it. That we devote ourselves to things that he feels are important. Last Sunday was the Sanctity of Human Life Sunday and I taught a lesson to my class that we are made in God's image and that we have a responsibility of a ch as a church to stand up for the rights of the unborn. In fact, the, the head, the CEO of the largest nonprofit in the United States, the United States supporting uh, pro-life issues said, really the church is the only organization with the world view to support the sanctity of human life. Interestingly enough, uh, January, uh, in 1984, President Ronald Reagan issued the first proclamation designating January the 22nd, the anniversary of Roe v. Wade decision that legalized abortion in all 50 states, as the National Sanctity of Human Life Day, uh, 1984. He famously said, this is Ronald Reagan, quote, I've noticed that everyone who is for abortion has already been born. He also stated, I believe that until and unless someone can establish that the unborn child is not a living human being, then that child is already protected by the Constitution, which guarantees life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness to us all. Now, why am I mentioning this? Because my sixth grandchild was born the Wednesday of this week. I've got a picture of little Noah Jake. Uh, Tyler and Lauren live in Waco. He teaches at Baylor. And that's their fourth child, second son. They, they, uh, two things that are pretty significant to me. His middle name, Jake, is my dad's name. And so they named him after my dad. And then he was born on Bonnie's mom's birthday. 
And her mom went to heaven several years ago, but uh, that's, he is very, very special to us. You see in the middle picture at the bottom, Tyler and Lauren, Bonnie, my wife on the left, holding little Noah, me on the right, holding Noah. We're doing the whole grandparent thing, you know, and if you want to see more pictures, I can meet you afterwards and do that. <laughs> I remember Jay Strack, he said, I've never been on an airplane where a 16-year-old reaches out with his phone and says, let me show you a picture of my grandpa. I never had that happen, and yet grandparents are crazy for showing pictures like this. Now think of the cognitive dissonance that goes on in my mind that I'm holding that little life, that little Noah Jake, my, my little grandchild. He's breathing, I swear to you. He smiled at me an hour after he was born. And meanwhile, on the anniversary of Roe v. Wade, the state of New York uh, assembly countered Reagan's point by redefining a person as a, quote, a human being is one who has been born and is alive. And so within that bill, it basically gives the mother the opportunity and the uh, right to abort a baby up until the moment that it's born. So I'm holding little Noah Jake and I'm thinking, he would not have been protected one hour ago in his mother's womb. But now he, he's a little person. And if anyone is going to stand up for him, it's going to have to be kingdom citizens. No one else is going to, to champion those rights. One last story. We were out to eat. Uh, took my wife on a date. Try to do that every single week, have for 45 years. I taught that to newlyweds, and I have to practice what I preach. So we're out on a date, and as often happens, the server comes to the table, and I said, how can we pray for you? Now, honestly, I do this every time I go out to eat, and I get all kinds of responses, some good, some bad, some indifferent. This guy, pretty bulky guy, he said, yeah, you can pray for me. I said, okay, what do you want me to pray about? And he goes, my brother was murdered two weeks ago. And I said, oh, man, I mean, we're just, and I said, tell me about it. And he said, uh, he came home from college, from Mobile, took his girl out to a club. Uh, evidently, it was a case of mistaken identity, and a guy began to accuse him of doing things. And he said, look, I'm not even from around here. I, I'm from Mobile. I'm just here for Christmas break. Uh, when he walked out of the club, he took his girlfriend to get out of that situation. A guy followed him out, clubbed him over the back of the head with his gun and shot him five times in the back. I said, that's awful. I said, please, let, let us pray for you. And then he did something really unusual for a server at a restaurant. He said, can I stand here and listen to you pray for me? I said, you can absolutely do that. Be honored if you'd do that. So I prayed for him, his mom, his family. And then as I raised my head, I said, obviously, I said, you come from a Christian family, right? I said, yeah. I said, you know your brother had received Christ as personal Savior, and you have, and your mom. He goes, absolutely right. He said, I could not be getting through this if I did not know that one day I would be reunited in heaven with my brother. I said, I'm going to continue praying for you. The, the man who, who shot him was taken into custody and... That becomes a legal issue at this point. But Joseph Stalin once famously declared, the death of one is a tragedy, the death of millions is a statistic. And as much as that one death affected me, I have to remember that since Roe v. Wade was enacted by the Supreme Court, it's estimated that 63 million babies have been aborted in the United States. And our generation has an opportunity to rise up and be the church and be kingdom citizens. The second thing I would say is that the biggest question you have to face tonight is, am I really a part of God's forever family? Have I really entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ? Until that is settled in your life, nothing else really, really matters. I, I said at the beginning, there are really five evidences in here, and it's something, you know, to, to search your heart. Has my moral character changed because Jesus has come into my life? Do I have a love for other Christians? Am I obedient to God's command? Is my answer yes? 
Am I willing to confess that Jesus Christ was a literal human figure of history, God become flesh, who died, buried, and rose again? And do I have the witness of the Holy Spirit in my life? If you have any question about any of those things in your life, then I would say we will have uh, ministers, counselors, deacons standing up here at the front, and they'd be willing to talk to you to work that out. I would also say if your family has been impacted by abortion, either you've had an abortion or someone close to you has had an abortion, I'm not trying to shame you or say that's the unforgivable sin. I'm saying that's a social problem that the church needs to rise up and address in our generation. But God's love is absolutely unquenchable, forgiving. You have a safe place here at Houston's First Baptist Church and we want to support you. In fact, We have trained counselors on staff. And if that's a struggle that you're having, we want to help you with that. We're going to have a time of response right now. And and if you have any single doubt about whether you're a Christian or not, we'd love to talk to you. If you want to join the church and be a part of a church that makes a difference in its community, we'd love to talk to you. If you simply want to come forward and pray and say, God, I want to honor you with my life. This time is for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your goodness and your grace that you chose us. We can't imagine that. But John declares at the beginning of this chapter, what manner of love is this that we are called the children of God? Father, thank you for that. Help us to appropriate it, walk confidently, love others, and live it out in our lives, having the worldview and the perspective that makes a difference. I pray, Father, that you bless this congregation. In Jesus' name.